Greetings, my late night listeners, and welcome back to Night Sessions, where we explore the realm of the unexplained, peruse the paranormal, and study the supernatural. I'm more than a bit late in saying this, but happy 2022. I know it took a while, but I'm finally here with my first episode of the year. I'd like to give a warm welcome to those of you who have recently subscribed. It's good to have you aboard. And for my returning listeners, thank you for sharing your time with me once again. Your presence here is always appreciated. So tonight, I bring you a tale of intrigue surrounding one of the most successful mystery writers the world has ever seen. While not exactly paranormal in nature, it's still one of perplexity and is as fascinating as a mystery novel itself. Involving unexplained circumstances, heartbreak, tragedy, and at last, a happy ending. It makes for a story worth telling. So grab your teddy and get ready as we dive headfirst into the life and disappearance of Agatha Christie. Agatha Christie, full name, Dame Agatha Mary Clarissa Christie, Lady Malowin, is known for her written works of mystery and crime. Some of her beloved characters include the impeccable inspector Hercule Poirot, who is sure to solve any case no matter the level of complexity, as well as the unassuming, yet never to be underestimated, Miss Marple. Nothing escapes the keen eye of this self-made detective who just happens to be in all the wrong places at all the right times. Agatha, having written over 90 books and several plays in her lifetime, I'd think it's safe to say the woman was quite an expert in, well, murder, and how to almost get away with it. While I was first intrigued by the mystery of her disappearance, which we'll get to a little later, the more I looked into her life, the more fascinating it became, and I quickly found that in order to tell her story, we'd have to go back to the beginning. Traveling back in time to 1890, darling baby Agatha was born to a loving American father and a caring British mother. Although not an entirely wealthy family, Agatha grew up comfortably, the youngest of three siblings. While the others had attended boarding school in their youth, Agatha's mother insisted she have a home education. Taught by her older sister and parents, Agatha flourished, learning to read by age five and reveling in her freedom and abundant imagination. However, her childhood came to an abrupt end. When she was just 11 years old, her father tragically passed away. The family's financial state took a hit. Her older sister married soon after, and Agatha was sent to school, where she struggled to adapt to the rigid environment. When she became a teenager, her mother sent her to Paris to study piano and singing. Agatha thought she might pursue a career in music and theater. She had the skill to do so, but her shyness led her to determine a life on stage was not the path for her. After completing her studies, she returned to England, only to find her mother's health had grown quite weak. Together, they decided to spend the next months in a warmer climate. Escaping the bitter cold of the northern winter, they headed to Cairo, Egypt, to bask in the sun under a desert blue sky. For three months, they stayed in Egypt at the Jazeera Palace Hotel, which was a popular tourist destination at the time. Agatha was kept busy with many social activities, dances, and sightseeing of the ancient Egyptian monuments. 
While not overly interested in the history of the place, this experience would later fuel her love for archaeology. Once their time in Egypt came to an end, she returned to Britain and resumed her usual activities. By age 18, she had completed her first short story while confined to bed, recovering from an illness. Soon after, she brought more and more stories into being, most of which were based off of her fascination with the paranormal. Which brings us to our first mildly creepy tale, titled The Call of Wings. I won't read the entire story, but I will give a brief summary of its content, as well as all the good spoilers. It begins when a certain gentleman witnesses the accidental death of a homeless man and leaves the scene deeply troubled believing he could have saved the man. He heads home, but before entering his front door, he hears beautiful music coming from a piper who appears to have no legs. For the next several nights, he hears the same tune. Once asleep, he feels as though he begins floating, and he experiences many amazing sights and sees colors that have no name, to which he gives the nickname wing color. However, these moments of happiness are cut short, as something always pulls him back down, causing him physical pain in the process. One day, he decides to ask the piper who he really is. In answer, the piper draws a picture of a fawn, a half-human body with the legs of a goat, and implies he was indeed the god Pan but he cut off his legs because, and I quote, they were evil. Without the goat legs, he now appears to be human. By now, the man has become addicted to the music, and one day, while hurrying home, he decides to take the train. As he waits on the platform, he witnesses a homeless man fall onto the tracks, moments before the train arrives. Feeling that this is his second chance to redeem himself, he quickly pulls the man off the tracks and onto the platform, only to lose balance and tumble onto the tracks himself. Before he meets the oncoming train, he briefly hears the sound of a piper playing his song. And with that, the tale comes to a most unsettling end. Another title from Agatha's early years is The Last Seance. The story takes place in France, where a particularly sensitive medium performs a seance to bring from the spirit realm the dead daughter of a grieving mother. She had performed this ritual a time before for the woman, and the spirit of the daughter had appeared more accurately than most. But this time, the woman said she wished to verify it, that it wasn't a scam or a trick being played on her somehow. She suggested they tie the medium's assistant to a chair, ensuring he wouldn't be able to meddle in the ritual. The medium and her assistant both agreed, but warned the woman not to touch the apparition when she appeared. However, as soon as her daughter materialized, the woman ran to hug her ignoring the cries of pain coming from the medium. The woman then picks up the ghostly form of her daughter and runs from the room, not stopping to realize the medium had gone silent, ignoring her shriveled, lifeless form on the ground.
As Agatha tried to publish some of her early works, most, if not all, were rejected from publication. It was around this time that she soon began working on her first novel. In addition, her social activities began to expand, and she met her husband-to-be, Archibald Christie, a royal artillery officer. The two quickly fell in love, and Archie proposed only three months after their first meeting. Agatha readily accepted. But their happily ever after was cut short by the outbreak of World War I. Their wedding was held on Christmas Eve while Archie was home on leave from the military. For the next four years, Agatha devoted herself to the war effort, first as a volunteer nurse and later as a qualified apothecary's assistant. In 1918, her service came to an end and her husband was reassigned to London, where they rented a flat. Agatha once again had the freedom to work on her writing. By this time, works such as Sherlock Holmes by Arthur Conan Doyle and The Woman in White by Wilkie Collins had gained in popularity, and Agatha was very much a fan. Diving into the genre herself, she wrote her very first detective novel, featuring the unique inspector Hercule Poirot. The inspiration behind the former Belgian police officer with a most impressive mustache came from her experience in treating Belgian refugees and soldiers during the war, and her book was published in 1920. All was running smoothly, and she soon became a mother herself, giving birth to her only child, the sweet Rosalind Margaret Clarissa. Two years after her first book was released, she and her husband embarked on a promotional tour around the world. For ten months they traveled, leaving little Rosalind in the care of Agatha's mother and sister. Together, the couple was quite adventurous, dedicating much of their free time to surfing in South Africa and Hawaii, where it's said they impressed the locals by being able to surf standing up. After their year of touring, they returned to their home and reunited with their daughter in England. Agatha resumed writing until a few years later when her mother, whom she was very close with, passed away. This loss sent her into a deep depression, and to make matters worse, her husband asked for a divorce, stating he had fallen in love with another woman. Later, on a cold December night, the couple had an argument. Mr. Christie announced he was spending the weekend away from home with friends, and Agatha was apparently not invited. I'm sure he was met with opposition, and I don't know if he ever took that trip, but Agatha had plans of her own. It was on this very night that Agatha vanished. Her absence was noticed the next morning, and upon searching the surrounding area, her vehicle was discovered, parked above a nearby quarry. Some of her clothes were left inside the parked car, along with an expired license. The story quickly became newsworthy, as the mystery crime writer seemed to become the victim of a mysterious crime herself. The search for Agatha was met with no small response. Thousands of volunteers and officers joined the effort. There was a reward set for 100 British pounds, which equates to about 8,000 US dollars today. It almost seemed as though the public enjoyed the hunt for the missing writer. Even Arthur Conan Doyle, a fellow mystery writer himself, got involved in the search and had one of Agatha's gloves analyzed by a psychic medium. Agatha remained out of sight for about 10 days before she was discovered in a hotel in Yorkshire, nearly 200 miles from where her car was parked. She was a registered guest at the hotel, but she was going by the name of her husband's mistress. After her whereabouts were discovered, she departed to her sister's home, where she effectively shut out the rest of the world. In her silence after the incident, theories from the public ran wild. Some suggested she did it to embarrass her husband, underestimating the interest the public would have in the matter. Some suggested it was a publicity stunt. Later, a biographer of Agatha's, 
concluded it was the result of a nervous breakdown and suggested she was not fully aware or conscious of her actions at the time. Meanwhile, others speculated a theory more fitting of her career. Perhaps it was an attempt at framing her husband for murder. Nonetheless, it remains a mystery, even to Agatha, it would seem. She visited two separate doctors after her disappearance that both diagnosed her with unquestionable loss of memory. And that appears to be the final word on the matter. The only thing she added later in her biography was this. So after illness came sorrow, despair, and heartbreak. There is no need to dwell on it. A statement which I suppose meant she was ready to move on, and I think politely asking everyone else to do so as well. By this time, Agatha had had enough of England, and with a one-way ticket, boarded the Orient Express to Istanbul. She became exceedingly more interested in archaeology, and even participated in a few digs herself. It was on a site in Iraq that she met and fell in love with Max Mellowin, a man 13 years her junior. Soon after, the couple was married, and dare I say, lived happily ever after. They went on many an archaeological expedition together, and enjoyed traveling all through the Middle East. It was an experience that gave Agatha inspiration for several novels, such as Murder on the Orient Express, as well as Death on the Nile, a story which has just seen another remake in theaters. By the way, if you've gone to see it, let me know if it's any good. Agatha's husband was later knighted for his archaeological work, which gave Agatha the title Lady Mallowan. In later years during World War II, she once again put her medical experience to use, working in a pharmacy where she gathered more knowledge of not only medicines, but also poisons. Knowledge which she promptly applied to her writing, making a new addition to her arsenal of hypothetical murder weapons. After the success of her writing, Agatha appeared to reach the peak of her career. She continued to write till the end of her days. She wrote through her declining health and passed away peacefully at the age of 85, leaving behind many a written work which would be enjoyed by the world for years to come. Despite the twists and turns her life took, one thing remained the same, her love of stories and the drive to tell them. She put her experiences to good use and shared them with the world. I'll leave you with one final remark from Agatha. I like living. I have sometimes been wildly, despairingly, acutely miserable, wracked with sorrow. But through it all, I still know quite certainly that just to be alive is a grand thing. As always, thank you so much for listening, and I hope to see you again soon. So if you enjoyed tonight's show, give this video a thumbs up, hit the subscribe button, and ring the little bell to be notified of upcoming shows. And remember, keep watch, my friend. The world is a mysterious place. Until next time, you're listening to Night Sessions, and I'm your host, signing off.